Things aren't always perfect the first time. Daymare 1998 was the first game in what is now the Daymare series, and just so happened to be my first review. Now the game and the review were... But now the sequel, or rather the prequel, is here with Daymare 1994 Sandcastle, and it's a chance for redemption for both of us. I'm Adam Scott, and this is Daymare 1994 Sandcastle. Daymare 1998, the debut title for small independent Invader Studios, has developed quite a cult following among old school Resident Evil fans, which is no shocker since it started as an unofficial Resident Evil 2 remake. That was, of course, before Capcom released a little something of their own. Daymare 1998 was a game that I truly wanted to love, and for the most part I did, but there were fundamental problems throughout. From its irritating reloading system, to the terrible script and awful voice acting, the constant rough edges made the experience just as frustrating as it was fun. But Daymare won't be killed so easily, and has returned from beyond the grave! Daymare 1994 Sandcastle, released in 2023, on last and current gen Xbox and PlayStation consoles, PC and Switch, and is a prequel taking place, as the title would suggest, four years prior to the first game, and is now a sandcastle building simulator. What's that? Who it's not? Uh, meant to say it's a survival horror game that attempts to correct the sins of the past, improving on the first game in nearly every way. So let's see if Daymare 1994 Sandcastle is a nightmare or a daydream. First impressions are night and day over the original in nearly every way. Unlike the first game, you won't bounce around to multiple protagonists. You'll play only as Delilah Rays. Or is it Rays? No, seriously, all the text spells it like this. But the shoulder ID is spelled like this. Nailed it. Well, however the hell you spell it, you're a special agent for Hades, a private military group working for a large biotech company. As part of Operation Sandcastle, oh, there it is, you've been sent to Area 51, yeah, THE Area 51, to find a missing agent and collect the all-important MacGuffin. And it turns out, Area 51 has secrets. Yeah, I know, right? And yeah, let's just say things don't go as planned with reanimated corpses and other creatures filling the dark hallways, forcing you to fight your way through as you uncover the broader conspiracy. But you already knew that, didn't you? What was a surprise is how much of an improvement the story is compared to the first game. It definitely helps to keep things focused on a single protagonist, but the overall script and writing is just a lot stronger. It's not the greatest story ever told, but it works really well at keeping you interested and moving things forward. While Daymare 1998 started out as an unofficial Resident Evil 2 remake, this prequel very much feels like its own thing. It still has a lot of the survival horror hallmarks, like limited inventory, puzzles, save points, and of course, zombies, but now it has more Resident Evil 4 or Dead Space energy, with its stronger focus on action horror. This isn't necessarily a bad thing by any stretch, but it does shift away from the original game's promise of a return to traditional survival horror. Through this transition, there were some bold gameplay decisions, not all of which are winners, but there's no doubt this game feels a lot better to play. Taking that familiar over-the-shoulder camera angle, you traverse the corridors, offices, and laboratories of Area 51. It's clear early on just how linear it all is. Sure, you'll sometimes backtrack a little or revisit a previous area to open a door that was locked, but for the most part, you'll be pushing forward. I suspect most won't be bothered as that forward momentum helps to drive the pacing, but if you were expecting that labyrinthine level design of the original Resident Evil games, you might be disappointed. You'll find optional files and audio logs that help to flesh out the story, and those with a keen eye can take out the hidden alien bobbleheads. I wonder where they got that idea. Puzzles are peppered throughout, breaking up the combat and exploration. 
these are fairly standard fare for this type of game, and most are easy enough to figure out, often with the solution right in front of you. Solving them grants you extra goodies and weapon upgrades, so it's good to take the time to solve them. The weapons in combat are likely to be the most controversial design decisions. When you're going to a secret government facility infested with the undead, what do you want more than anything else? Guns. Lots of guns. Right. Pretty much goes without saying. Think of the arsenal you get in Resident Evil 4. This huge variety not only gives you the ability to change up your playstyle and approach for each new combat scenario, but keeps the combat feeling fresh throughout. In Daymare 1994, you'll get two guns, a machine gun and a shotgun. And that's it. No, seriously, you can upgrade these, but it feels limiting to only have two firearms. That is, until you add one other weapon, the Frost Grip which is the primary gameplay gimmick. This gauntlet focuses on ice powers, as the name suggests. You'll use the Frost Grip for both combat and some environmental puzzles in progression like putting out fires or freezing burst pipes, that type of thing. The Iceman cometh. It starts off simple enough, slowing down foes to give you some breathing room. Then you'll get new functionality like mines, shields, and group targeting bombs. Hell yeah! Over time, the frost grip isn't just part of the combat, it becomes central to it as enemies are introduced that can't be hurt until they're frozen. Unlike the limited ammo for the two guns, the frost grip has unlimited energy, and while it'll refill automatically, it takes a million years. So you'll want to create some space when the gauge is depleted. And don't expect a lot of alone time. You'll spend the bulk of the game fighting for your life from a few different basic zombies, all juiced up and ready to eat your face. You can identify what you're dealing with by their color. The blue ones can be taken out by anything at your disposal, but the red ones need to be frozen before you can kill them. And seriously, don't shoot them with your guns or you'll be wasting ammo. As you enter a new area, you'll hear the sound of an enemy being brought to life, but not sure where exactly, giving you that feeling of growing anxiety. Just know, if you see enemies in front of you, there's a good chance something is sneaking up behind you, so keep your head on a swivel. And like your mom, most of the enemies are very grabby, which slows your momentum as you go from one to the next to the next getting grabbed each time. Evaluating the gameplay is difficult. It's almost a tale of two games. You see, the first half of the game is crushingly brutal even on normal difficulty. One or two enemies can take you out in seconds, and when swarmed by a half dozen or more, forget about it. There were these punishing sections where I reloaded over and over, trying to squeeze by, often without any health or ammo in sight. Yes, in a survival horror game, difficulty is important for fear, but I found these sections more frustrating than scary. And then there's the second half, particularly in the last 30 minutes or so, where I was flush with ammo and health items, so much in fact that I couldn't hold anymore, and with the upgrades to the frost grip, I was unstoppable. I became death, destroyer of worlds, mowing down waves of enemies without a sweat. With a bit more balancing, the power arc would feel more earned, instead of a light switch being turned on. And yes, I wish there were more weapons. That being said, I found the overall package to be a lot of fun, with decent, if unbalanced, challenge. And hey, it never gets old blasting zombies in the face and seeing pieces go flying. I'll admit, I went into Sandcastle expecting a similar mess to Daymare 1998, but with a fresh coat of paint. However, Invader Studios has managed to exceed my expectations, creating something much more polished, landing squarely in AA territory, and one of the best looking indie games of this generation. Visually, and with the benefit of more powerful systems, Sandcastle looks downright amazing at times. Sure, it doesn't have that big budget money, but they've pulled off some serious magic. Area 51 looks dank and scary, with fantastic volumetric lighting creating the thick atmosphere. There's a lot of particle effects, blood, and gore during the combat, and this one section where you're running around in a storm looks freaking awesome. The biggest shortcoming is the visual variety. Since we spend the bulk of our time in Area 51, we see a heck of a lot of similar looking labs with only a few different enemies and only a couple of weapons. That feeling of you've seen this all before builds over the course of the game. 
In terms of technical performance, I didn't have any issues with it. No impactful bugs or crashes, which is a miracle compared to the first game. Now a few enemies did, well, they did this, but even that was pretty rare. The character animations are a bit strange, but it wasn't overly distracting. The character models, on the other hand, there's something off about them. I feel like I've seen them before, but I couldn't quite put my finger on it. But I did feel super patriotic. And while they were nearly constant in the first game to the point of being distracting, the pop culture references returned but were toned down considerably. The voice acting smacks of B-movie camp, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. Back off, man. I'm a scientist. But it's not so bad it's good, like the original Resident Evil. That was too close. You were almost a Jill sandwich. <laughs> You're right. Or top tier, like the Dead Space remake. Easy to say the wrong thing. I don't blame you. I'd listen to my girlfriend over him and reciting security protocols. Instead, it lands somewhere in the middle. Survival. The first commandment, the prime imperative. Let me out of here! And I have to recognize the stellar sound design with great overall effects, deep, punchy bass, and solid use of surround sound so you know where everyone is even if you can't see them. Given the genre, it shouldn't be a surprise that you can get through the campaign in around six hours. However, for those completionists, there's still plenty more to do. There are a number of collectible and combat trophies that you can easily track your progress on. Thankfully, progress carries over through multiple playthroughs. Based on the ranking you get, you'll get perks that will help with subsequent playthroughs, like unlimited ammo. From there, you'll have challenge trophies, like getting an S rank on hardcore difficulty, which requires you to get through in four hours or less without dying. All in, you're looking at upwards of 20 to 25 hours to do everything. Okay, when boiling this down, there are two questions to answer. First, is Daymare 1994 Sandcastle an improvement over the original? And without a doubt, it's a resounding yes. It's clear Invader Studios has learned from their first outing and has grown as a studio, making a more polished, focused, and fun game than before. The other question is how this game stacks up against the tons of AAA horror games that we've been graced with lately. And the short answer is, it doesn't. It doesn't have the polish, mechanical depth, or nuanced story of those AAA games. But it has a campy story, fun combat, and zombies to blast into bits. Oh, and it's priced appropriately. What more could you ask for? Damn straight. Get your ass off that chair. So is it perfect this time around? No. But seeing just how much of a step up this game is, I can't wait to see what Invader Studio does in the future. Okay, there's Daymare 1994 Sandcastle. If you liked the video, hit like, comment, and subscribe. And if you want another game that you haven't played, check out my video right here. I want to thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time.